Hi, everyone. Um, so I am a new director in Stuttgart. I joined two years ago. And I'll talk about, as, as mentioned, uh, small robots today. And I come, I come from the United States. But I'm originally from Turkey, and I've been around the world. Um, so before I start about my research activity, my group focuses on what we call physical intelligence, which is a new term that I'd like to briefly mention. Because today, we heard a lot of interesting things about intelligence for robotics. Uh, but let me show you that looking at this axis of cells and then bigger cells like this is C. elegans, like you know, jellyfish and insect, a cat and a human. With the neurons, let's say for a cell, zero. There is no neuron, just single cells. And then the C. elegans have 300, then you go thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions and billions of neural cells evolved uh, to create complexity, OK? So as biological systems, of course, life started here. And in that regard, the intelligence of these systems, I'll show you, is not zero. They have what we call a lot of intelligence coming from not neural computation that we are used to in the large scales, but coming from materials, smart materials, interactions that create intelligence at the very small scale. As you see, the small systems with limited uh, computation it especially requires this kind of intelligence becoming very important. But after some scale, like after insects, we will see that vertebrates are so advanced with neural computation that exponentially we can create complexity. That's why nature created neural cells, and the oldest network created much interesting complexity in our brains. So uh, that's why I want to focus on the small systems with no brain or very little brain. Uh, so this is an amoeba with no brain. Again, this cell has only sensors around its membrane that detects this plant cell, can perceive the environment, can act by moving on the surface, and eventually have a mission of catching this plant cell and eating it. So this is a very complex behavior. How the sensing happens, how these molecules and motors, biological motors move, we cannot do this at the moment, even at this scale with robotics synthetic systems. And as I mentioned, with these limitations of tiny systems, of course, nature figured out that you need to start collaborating and swarming type of uh, interesting, uh, co uh, this kind of coordinated behavior. Because a single uh, ant wouldn't be able to carry a big uh, piece of heavy uh, fig, but many teams working together can do that. And if you are also small cells, if you are highly dense in a given environment, you create this organized behavior. There is no chaos there. It's self-organized to a pattern that creates specific fluidic flow that attracts food from outside to the swarm that everyone can survive. So these are all interesting behavior we want to learn from biology. Um, and as, uh, as I mentioned, besides the intelligence aspect, like you see there are all these length scale of robots. And I'm interested in especially these tiny ones because of this physical intelligence, as I mentioned. And besides that, also in engineering and in technology, more and more, we need small robots. One reason is, as you saw in the previous talk, if you want to get inside your body, you need to be small. Right? You cannot access to a space, uh, if especially it's a small channel or body or a tube or a crack, you need to be small. Or my pocket, you need to get small as small as my pocket. And also portability, because big robots are very heavy. For example, an example of NASA robot, as you know, this Mars rover, they sent one, and when the robot fails, the mission is doomed. Because there was a big robot, very heavy, uh, very complicated with everything, but with one robot, you fail, and all mission goes away. So that's why NASA is now looking at much smaller, many robots. So there's a big mission robot. This is a, a study we had with NASA uh, previously that deploys many small robots to the environment so that you can make many of them, like the insects I showed you, or cells, that can work in parallel. And if one fails, the mission still continues, because they can still adapt and learn and still actively work together. So in that sense, you see a lot of new systems being uh, created by scientists and engineers for medical uses, uh, as we saw in the previous talk also, that I'll show you more examples, and also for space or monitoring environments, manufacturing and inspection. So, of course, when you look at literature, uh, besides uh, scientists and engineers, the first examples in most cases happen as you know, happens in art and, and science and, and like our history. So, of course, the first concept of a miniature robot was a submarine, which was shrinked, as you might have seen in this old movie. 
um, that uh, goes inside the human body. That's our big dream, is right? So we have this really desire that how we can make machines go inside the body. Not like this, of course. This is a submarine that you shrink into that size. Is of course not. It's a science fiction. But they did a lot of realistic visual effects about the body, and they got the Oscar Prize um, uh, for that. And in that sense, really, what happens in U.S. also Hollywood is. Artists take a lot of ideas from scientists and they create them in a science fiction or other fictionary way the first and then we indeed make them happen later and in that sense we do a lot of consulting to Hollywood and kind of, kind of movie industry these days more and more. Um, as I mentioned looking at nature uh, because as I showed the complexity uh, even at the small scale of the biological systems at the moment there is no way we can compete with nature but what we should do then is join it. Joining means learning from nature, getting inspiration at, especially in my expertise of small systems. So these are animals I work with. And the concept here and the philosophy is, um, by evolution, as I mentioned, we started from very single molecules and cells and created complexity by evolution. And evolution figured out by optimization in complex environments how to survive. But when the solutions were created for survival, the solution was just good enough, never perfect. Okay, perfection is always created by our, our man-made desires, but indeed, if you're just good enough in nature, you survive, and that's what evolution cares about, not ambitious organisms that will create, indeed, negative effect environment. So uh, they are very intelligent, they can adapt, they can learn, they can uh, you know, survive in complex changing environment. They need to preserve energy, that's very important that nature is, of course, evolved to do very well. But on the other hand, you need to be fast, otherwise you will be eaten by predators. That's why they learn how to be fast and maneuverable. And in engineering and science, we look at these systems and learn the principle, not exactly copying. We saw a great example uh, at the beginning about the Minecraft robot, which was a great concept to create a model of a biological system to understand or study biological system is one approach of by inspiration. But in our case, as a second approach, rather than creating a mimic of the biological system, we take the principle how this animal attaches, how this animal flies, and use the physics in an adapted way in other engineering systems. And the resulted robot, I will show you, will not look like the animal necessarily the same. But the principle will be the same. Because we don't have exactly what biology has in the sense of actuators, sensors, and computation, no complexity at the moment. So, uh, for example, when we look at animals, uh, one thing we first start to get inspiration is the materials that animals use. So if you look at this best climber in nature is a gecko lizard that can climb on anything very fast. And we looked at the f uh, feet of this animal and figured out these hairs, which are very tiny branching, tree-looking kind of structures at the very small scale, much smaller than our hair, 100 times smaller, even the small ones are 1,000 times smaller. You can see that uh, evolution figured out these structures to stick to surfaces, and we used the same principle of attachment with structures, not with chemistry, and created this synthetic adhesive that is currently being commercialized, which will be uh, useful in daily life. That will change a lot of things that we are currently using as clothing and adhesives uh, in daily life. So that all started with an animal that we understood how to climb, and then uh, we used it. Of course, when we started this project a long time ago at UC Berkeley, when I was a postdoc there, uh, we got funding from agency that they wanted a climbing robot. That's the reason we invented this new material. Because with this new interesting structure, it is enough, you can make a tiny floor, robot because wall, you don't need pumps or complex uh, attachment principles. Material sticks by right attachment of loading and unloading by peeling. Although and now this robot can climb on almost climbing. any surface in a very easy, wall. very compact way. So enabled by the smart material. So this was another biological complexity example how a lizard can run on water. That is amazing and very, of course, uh, Christianly interesting uh, lizard creature. It's called Jesus Lizard, <laughs> other name. Um, when I saw this in a conference by a biologist showing an example of how biology is complex, I said, we should make a robot uh, using the same principle. And this is the robot exactly using the same principle. As you see, uh, this is the real speed of the animal. Indeed, when you study the physics of this lizard, you figure out that the legs have a specific rotation trajectory, and it's very fast using the tail for balance control and it's pure physical law that really is possible to run on water. There are a lot of hype in YouTube. You can go and see people running. 
And the homework was always check that out, and you will figure out big systems cannot do it, but small systems can do it. To do it, you need to be as fast as a Ferrari, and you need to be really high energy density. It's physically not impossible, but not the efficient way. But for small animals, this could be a very interesting, efficient way uh, for water surface locomotion. And then we started looking at, rather than just one mode of locomotion, what about can we do both jumping and gliding type of, because animals just don't fly or just don't jump, they do many things together, like we can do swimming, running, everything. And this animal was very interesting, vampire bat. If you go to South America, they basically use uh, livestock like sheep or cow blood. That's why they are vampire bat, they really suck blood. And when there's a danger, because they need to go ground to uh, suck blood from the animals, they use their wings. Look at the wings are used as a leg first to jump. Then they turn into wings, because they are, the same muscles are used for jumping and then flight. Then this is the robotic concept by my student. With a lot of years of uh, engineering, we can create the same principle by the design that we made synthetically. So uh, these are very interesting systems to create high energy efficient locomotion in complex environment. So uh, also, as we saw the example uh, before, uh, so uh, small robots are especially will have high impact for medicine. So this is a capsule robot that we developed, which is what we call soft one, because when you press it, it's very soft, so no, it can not harm inside the body anything. And because of also softness, we remotely use magnetic field to contract it axially, and that creates a pressure that ejects a drug or can do also biopsy. We showed all these principles, and this is the camera images. So in that sense, this is a swallowable device that can go to your stomach and do many things that normal flexible endoscopes do these days. So this will be very non-invasive, so uh, that you will have no uh, sedation and no pain. And these are things now getting real. So this is a, a project that we are right now applying in pigs. Uh, so that we can use in, in, in uh, people in the very near future in collaboration with Universal Tübingen. But I want to show you a little bit more uh, crazy ones, because as I mentioned at the beginning, science fiction, last 10 years, there have been a lot of exciting developments that nowadays micro robots are becoming a reality, not anymore science fiction. Because we figured out that as an old principle, you make a very tiny robot, you can use magnetic fields from outside to pull them around, or recently, uh, people figured out that if you make a micro tiny system with a specific material on the surface, and if the fluid has a specific chemical, the interaction can create bubbles that basically create a jet, let's say. So this is what we call chemical uh, propulsion. You can also use cells to actuate uh, robotic devices. As I mentioned at the beginning, we should join to nature. The second thing we are doing in the sense of joining is not only getting inspiration, but we integrate cells to robots to use them, like a horse pulling a cart, is all right? That's, a, of course, our very old style of using animals. Now the new style is, can we also use small animals like cells? So this is the example that I'll show you for medical applications that we have recently uh, studied. So the idea is we create these synthetic materials that are engineered. Um, it's a very small particle that we attach to bacteria. As you know, bacteria are very robust cells that can live in any environment almost. They are very dangerous sometimes, but typically they are also inside your body. There's 1.5 kilogram of bacteria right now inside my body helping to digest and helping a lot of things, and they are good to us. Only some dangerous ones sometimes create disease, but otherwise they are really useful. So we take the, basically your bacteria from your body, attach to these basically drugs, because this particle has inside a lot of drugs embedded, let's say in this case, cancer drug, and we also put magnetic nanoparticles inside the particle during the synthesis and attach them together. So then the idea is the magnetic particle inside can be used to direct these propelled particles because bacteria, when it is attached to the particle, will move it around. And then the bacteria can also sense the environment. So this is the, some of the data showing that these randomly moving swimmers, because of bacterial propulsion, when they have an attractant, you will see that they are basically attracted towards the chemical that they like to go. So they sense the disease and they can go there. And also, because of the magnetic material on the robot, we can remotely direct its motion towards the target. So we inject it and direct it to the right place. And when the particle comes to the right place, what happens is, this is a demonstration, that the, we call them bacteria bots, 
they basically deliver the cargo because of the interactions of the bacteria with the cells. Uh, there is an acidic environment that delivers the drug by time. And when you don't have any propulsion because of robotic bacteria attachment, the drug delivered, which is the current, uh, basically, implementation. So what you have right now is you get a lot of drug inside your body. They go everywhere. That's why you get a lot of side effects, okay? The current trend is these kind of active particles or active robots will go by the demand of the control of the doctor to the right place in the body. And in high dose, you can give this kind of drug because they will not go other cells because the bacteria fills these cells and you can also remotely direct them. That way, you can deliver drugs with minimal side effect inside your body in high amounts. That will change the way we can get drugs inside our body in the future. So that's kind of uh, the crazy approach. More non-crazy approach is using magnetic micro-robots. Because like an MRI system, we can have a lot of coils in around our body. And inside our body, we can put a micro-scale robot with magnetic material, and we can control it with the remote visual or other medical fe imaging feedback. So we are making now new crazy robots. So the principle is not crazy, but the robots are soft and very uh, kind of squishy. So we make it this a rubber with a magnetic material inside that when you apply field from outside, it starts like this flying carpet, and then it can swim and do any uh, locomotion that uh, is important for in liquid areas inside the body. And recent work we have done is even try to create animal-like soft robot that can not only swim, but can roll on the ground and then go to the liquid. And because of its material property, it doesn't uh, sink quickly. And by this body undulations, because it's soft, we can use magnetic actuation. As you see here, magnetic field is changing. That creates, in this case, the, uh, the swimming behavior. And then now it can go to the ground again, because like the insects do this, they change the body shape that climbs them with the surface tension. And it's hard to get from the liquid to the ground because of the liquid force are very high, but uses a rolling motion to get into the ground. Then it can become a now walking creature. So it will start now uh, doing a specific motion because we control field, and it starts walking. But now there's a big obstacle. So you can climb on it, but that's not an efficient way. What animals do in these cases is typically, what do you think? Jumping is all right. So, and this is slowed down, of course. These are all slowed down nine times. So the robot is really fast. And then uh, you can basically go over the obstacle, and that way uh, you can reach the complex environments. And also, let me show you a little bit other behaviors. It's, it keeps walking. But let's say now it came to a, let's say, small tube. OK, I cannot walk anymore. What can I do? So I can squeeze in a little bit and change now the motion uh, because of my, again, remote magnetic field. I can go inside the tube. And at the end, I can go back normal walking. And basically, this is the first time a simple, this is the simplest ever robot you can build. It's a sheet of robot, of course, programmed and designed very complex way. But the actuation is simple, and it can go inside your body. And this is the demonstration of medical use. This is a stomach model that the same robot now can go inside your uh, stomach. And this is a very complex environment with a lot of liquids and slippery surfaces. And it, when it comes to the, basically, the middle area, again, there's a big obstacle for the given size and it can jump. So, and it can carry drug and it can do a lot of things that will be useful functionally. So that's where we are going. And I tried to show you some examples today. And this kind of field of research, uh, like in any of the field of robotics, requires a lot of different disciplines. So my team has people from engineering, biology, physics, chemistry, computer science. Very international, very interdisciplinary. Everything's inter, inter, uh, and, and and a fun place to create uh, uh, exciting research in Max Planck Institute. So thank you.